Our dear Heavenly Father, we just take a minute, Lord, to thank you for your faithfulness to us. Would you help us to just clear our minds and uh, be receptive, be eager, be anxious to hear from you through your word, through what you've got lined up for us all tonight, collectively and individually, Lord. I thank you for the men that have taken time and made the time to make this a priority to come out here to be a part of our group, be a part of our class, be it here in Tampa or any of our satellite discussion groups, Lord, from Zephyr Hills to Dade City to Brandon to Lakeland to Ruskin and wherever you might direct us in the future. Would you bless these men, Lord, and uh, bless your word this evening. Help us to take home your nugget for us. In your name we pray. Amen. So again, welcome you. Tonight we're in Matthew chapter 14. We're looking at ministry leading up to recognition of Jesus as Messiah. And uh, in context, I think it's a story a lot of us know, or should I say are familiar with, but yet even as I went through here a couple times and prayed about this and prepared tonight, there's so many principles and so much depth here. So I hope that you have the occasion to take notes tonight. Perhaps, like me, you might see something differently than you've seen it before. And uh, hopefully the Holy Spirit will impress something upon you. My aim tonight, starting off with that, is that only Jesus can satisfy our spiritual needs. And our key verse at the top of your lesson each week is a key verse. If you're looking at that, is Matthew 14, 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. And the focus there that I'd like for us is really worship. You know, who God is when you're worshiping for who he is, right? I also just, I happen to be a detail guy, if you don't know that about me. So this week, the key verse is verse 30, 33 in chapter 14. Last week, if you're looking at these scriptures and memorizing them, the key verse was also verse 33 in chapter 13. But um, having said that last week, Matthew 13, we're looking at all the parables that Jesus taught, using them as truths to teach about his kingdom. So tonight I'm actually going to have three divisions. Uh, instead of going through all three together, I'll just go through them as we come along. But if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14, we'll start off with our first division. So here, Herod executes John the Baptist, or should I say has him executed, by way of a beheading. Probably of all the ways that you could possibly die, that's something you don't consider. And perhaps John didn't consider that, but in the first 12 verses of Matthew, it opens up pretty candidly with that. So first, a little background. Uh, in verse 1. Herod, there's many different Herods in the Bible, and some of them you may know, some of you you may not know. Um, I think of Rod Tanner, who sits out here, our class secretary, with all his biblical coins, and I remember him having a coin of Herod Antipas. I thought he might have brought that tonight, but he always surprises us, surprises me. Tonight's a different coin, but if you haven't looked at that, um, drop in on Rod on the way out, but Herod here is Herod Antipas. He's the son of the famous Herod the Great, a subordinate ruler, one of the four, what, regions in the territory that were divided when uh, Herod passed divisions within the Roman Empire. And he split the territory among three of his sons. So Herod Antipas became ruler over Galilee and also a fourth son, we bring that in, Scripture's telling us because of the story and how story's going to unfold, Scripture's going to unfold. He lived in Rome. His name was Philip. And I, of all the Herods, I always forget that there's a fourth, but Philip uh, lived in Rome. And he was married to Herodias. And Herodias, so the family, Philip married to Herodias. Herodias was somebody that Herod Antipas seduced, Scripture tells us. He had gone to Rome, presumably to visit his family, brother, perhaps other business, in some of those travels, seduced her. And as things developed, ended up bringing her to Galilee. 
ended up divorcing his wife to marry her. And from there, things just turn good to bad, probably. And uh, not to pass over that quickly, but in your own time and when you read through the notes, what I'd like for us to see is the progression of sin. That was one of our questions. Number five, I've got my notes here. How does the progression of sin in Herod and Herodias' lives warn you personally? I want us just to see that progression of sin, right? Many times it starts with the eyes. You notice in this case, he noticed her. So it starts with the eyes, visual. And then, I don't know the next steps, and Scripture doesn't lay that out, but conversation, actions, behavior, putting yourself in places you shouldn't been. So just note that sin always has a progression. And many times, you might tend, we might tend, I might tend to discount that or not be aware of some of those steps. Oh, it's not a big thing. I can control it. Control's the big thing, right? We think we got it until we don't got it. And at that point, it's generally too late. But um, coming back to Scripture, in verse 4, we've got John the Baptist, and he had been warning Herod, hey, this isn't right. You can't do this. Um, It's not lawful for you to take her. It's not lawful for you to have her. It's wrong in Scripture. And from that, Herod had him imprisoned. So John, at this point, is in prison, being punished, being contained, if you will. And Herod, Scripture tells us, probably wanted to kill John, but he didn't in context at the time because in the political realm, the people thought John was a prophet. And he was more concerned with the people's thought and the people's opinion than his own feelings. Some of that perhaps wise in the term of politics, but in the terms of spirituality and living for the Lord and what God wants, not wise. And we're going to see some of that unfold here too. You know, choosing to please people rather than God is a serious matter. And as we go through this story, you can see what ends up happening to Herod, what ends up happening to Herodias as well. So as Scripture tells us and as we continue our story, there's a party coming up. It's Herod's birthday. And of all the things planned for his party, well, you need an entertainment for party, or should I say an entertainer, perhaps. And so in this context, that was Herodias' daughter, his stepdaughter, if you will. And Scripture tells us that she was dancing and had danced for Herod and all his guests. I always, in preparation, cross-reference a couple different translations of Scripture to look at different stories or words or points And in this case, in the message, it's talking about his celebration. And she was dancing the night away, dancing for all the guests. Talks about how she provided all the entertainment. So it suggests at face value there was more than a dance, right? So you can get the idea that people are partying, they're drinking. It said he's become drunk. Um, So it's a long event and long evening. And I paint that picture for you to say that Scripture tells us Herod was so amused, enamored, another scripture swept away and with his drunken enthusiasm that he ended up promising her, listen, I will give you anything you want. That's how outstanding I think this is. You've impressed me, whatever the vernacular was at the time. And prompted by her mother, Herodias, so let me stop there, prompted by her mother, Herodias, Why was her mother involved? Because again, John was warning Herod, what you're doing is wrong. This is sin. This isn't pleasing to God. So Herodias, as well as Herod, was upset with John the Baptist, right? So her mom thought, maybe this is a chance to get him back. So Herod promises the daughter, anything you want, mom. They ask for John's head on a platter, literally. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And uh, probably sobered Herod up pretty quickly, right? Again, he wanted to kill him earlier, but me wanting to do it versus somebody else asking me for that, it's probably a little bit different situation. But nonetheless, his guests were there. He was more concerned again with them and their perception of him, losing face, losing political power, perceived political power, favor perhaps. So he ordered it. 
Next thing you know, they're presenting John's head on a platter to her. And she in turn took it and gave it to her mother. And at that point, we're done with the beginning of that story about the party. Uh, not that that is a good way to end any party probably, but in verse 12, we're looking at John's disciples coming and taking the body to bury it. And I'm thinking, I just say that in terms of chronologically what happened at this point. I think for me, for us, here's where the story really unfolds. And that's in verse 13. The next step was they went and told Jesus. You know, John was Jesus' friend. He was more than just Jesus' friend, right? John's ministry was the forerunner of God's ministry, Jesus' ministry, if you will. Also through family, and the notes will get into this some, that they were dotted line, I call it, related. And you'll see that in, in the notes and in the lesson when you read them. But Jesus, when he heard this, what did he do? How did he react? How did he respond? Scripture tells us he withdrew. And he withdrew privately by boat to a solitary place. Paints a picture for us. Jesus withdrew privately for a solitary place. Easy to understand, right? You wanted time, perhaps needed time to get away, to think about it, to pray, to clear your mind, to grieve, to commune with your Father, to think it over. I think there's a takeaway for us here. And part of the takeaway like I said, there seems to be so many principles here, but um, just a takeaway for the evening that I wanted to share with you that jumped out, I think, is in times of grief and suffering, when you hear news that you don't like, we too, the model here, we too can go to our Father you know, in prayer, tell Him our burdens, right? He knows, He cares, He listens, He understands, He wants us to come to Him. He wants us to look to Him, to go to Him. He wants to comfort, wants to love, wants to heal. He understands from a point of experience. He doesn't understand my pain. Yeah, He does. He doesn't understand my temptation. Yeah, He does. He understands it all. You know, He's been where we are. As we share our burdens of grief, hurt, feelings of loss, feelings of insufficiency, inadequacy, whatever that feeling might be. Guys, feelings? Yeah, feelings. Jesus Christ, God the Son, can bring wholeness, can bring forgiveness, can bring restitution, reconciliation, whatever it may be that you need. He can bring wholeness. Jesus can bring healing, restoration, and hope even when, even when we are during our times of deepest sorrow, even when we're in that deepest place. You're one of those deep guys, you can go down the elevator shaft. He can find you. He can be with you. He can care for you. He can love you. He can strengthen you even in those times. I'm looking at men in this group I know have gone through those times. I know your stories, part of your stories. And isn't it a great thing that God not only can do that, but does do that for us, for you, for me. John was the one, like you're the one, personally, individually, whom Jesus truly cares for and longs for. Jesus truly cares for and longs for you. He's a personal God. And that brings me to my first principle this evening, which is obeying, following, and witnessing for Jesus is costly. It's costly. So many times in Scripture it tells us to count the cost. There is a cost. So some possible application questions in what areas of life are you asking God to grow your obedience? I'm asking him. Are you? I'm asking him for me, I should say. 
Whom are you witnessing sharing Christ with? And who might you be warning? Maybe it's family, friends, somebody in your inner circle, somebody, accountability partner. You know, God uses each of us in different ways and different roles, if you will. Or perhaps are there areas in your life in which you need to heed others' warning to you? I too have been in that role. And I thank God for those guys in my life who, as I call it, don't sell you sunshine. They tell you what the real deal is. You know, we've got men like that in this group. That's one of the things I get out of this group, right? Our second division tonight, Jesus miraculously feeds thousands. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. So we just ended the first division. Jesus wanted to get away. He wanted some solitary. He wanted to be by himself. Well, he wasn't alone long. People from surrounding towns had heard, seen, received the news, ran out to meet him, to meet him where he was going. They wanted to see him. They wanted to be with him. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to know a lot of different things. His desire for personal solitude was interrupted. Not just by the people, by their neediness. They had a lot of needs. Don't we have people like that today? We all know them, see them, come by them, have them cross our paths. And I think a big word tonight for all of us, certainly for me, is compassion. Coming through this next division, we're going to see compassion, 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 compassion. The compassion in Jesus' heart overruled the weariness in his bones, in his life, in in the moment. You know, verse 14 opens up, upon landing he saw the large crowd. What does scripture say? He had compassion on them. He healed the sick. He took the time. He listened. He cared. He was involved. He was grieving. He was grieving yet he still gave of himself. Why did he do that? Why? Because their needs spoke louder than his own. Let me say that again. Their needs spoke louder than his own. You know, I think of the scripture in Philippians 2. Look not not only unto your own needs, but also unto the needs of others. And in so doing, take on the form of Christ, who didn't come to be served, but to serve. So now, from this point on, we see Jesus intentionally focused on the growing faith of his disciples in ways that would change them, and he called them to support righteousness in much the same way as he does today, much the same way he does to you and to me. Large crowd, large crowd. You had your class, your group, your sharing, scripture, the notes, you know, talks about the men, but women and children all told, there's reference there to maybe 20,000 people or more, large crowd. In verse 15, the disciples are going to Jesus, urging him to send those people, picture 20,000 people, hey, can you send them away? I mean, it's late in the day, it's the evening, they're hungry, I'm hungry, we're hungry, They need to go get some food. They need to take care of themselves. This is remote. There's nowhere around here for food. Hmm, the story. Jesus used that situation as a teachable moment. Guess what? He's using it tonight as a teachable moment. Tonight. Same things he's teaching them, he's teaching us. He's teaching me through tonight's lesson, through his word. He wanted to develop his disciples' faith and their experience with his faithful provisions the same way he wants to develop yours and the same way he develops, wants to develop mine. So four points for us. First point is recognize the overwhelming need. Verse 15. You might say, well, Walter... They saw the need. They went to him asking for food. Yeah, but 
they were really focused on their insufficiencies, what they couldn't do, what they didn't have, what wasn't around, rather than having necessarily compassion for the people. They wanted the problem to go away. Hey, I'm going to fix it. We need food. We don't have food. Can you send them home? Send them to get their own food. Let them take care of their own needs. Jesus wanted them to feel compassion, than to see it, than to have it. I put down here, Christ's power through us enables us to feel compassion. Maybe it doesn't come naturally. Maybe it needs developed in us. But Christ's power through us gives us that, enables in that in us. As we follow Christ, we depend on His power, His sufficiency, His, His, not ours, enabling us to focus on others' needs and not our insufficiency. Point two, acknowledge your insufficient resources. We see that in verses 16 to 17. Instead of sending the crowd away, what was Jesus' response? (laughs) You feed them. I'm sorry, didn't we just tell you we don't have any food here? His response is, you feed them. Give them something to eat. I think in that command, Jesus is again saying, look at your resources. Right? This could be so deep here. I mean, the easy resource, what's the easy resource? Well, I can see the loaves and fish we have. That's the easy resource. What's the harder resource? Jesus. Did you count him as a resource? Do you count Jesus as a resource? Do I? Do we count him as a resource? Jesus allowed them to quantify the reality that they didn't have what he required, what his command required. Third point, give Jesus what you have. Verses 18 and 19. He commanded them, bring them to me. Bring the loaves and fishes to me. And then there's a process, starting with giving thanks. You know, I don't have much, but what I have I'm thankful for and I give thanks for. I recognize where they came from and who blessed me. And then he instructed the disciples to distribute the meal. Think about that, practically speaking. You're there, you're witnessing this in your mind. Five loaves, two fishes. Jesus lifts them up, gives thanks, gives them to you, and the other disciple says, now go feed everybody. 20,000 people, go feed them. In my mind, that's pretty, pretty profound. I don't think it was an accident. I think it was intentional that he involved the disciples. He wanted them to experience. He wanted them to see. He wanted them to learn. He wanted them to grow. He wanted them to be stretched, perhaps. All they needed to do is give what God had given them. And I think that's one of the key points, right? Everything we have comes with God, from God. We're just the stewards. Some of that God gives us to share with others. Some of that God gives us to give away. And then four, the icing on the cake, to experience God's abundant provision. Not just provision, abundant provision. Verses 20 and 21. Scripture tells us in verse 20, they all ate and were satisfied. Well, if you're my 100-pound mother, you can be satisfied easier probably than I can eating, right? Right? But for everybody to be satisfied suggests some people had more than one serving, perhaps. Right? How satisfied were they? They ate everything they wanted, everything they could. And there was 12 baskets of leftovers. Is that a coincidence? Probably not with God. How many disciples were there? How many baskets were there? Again, I think it's part of this training, part of this development. God wanted each one of them to be involved. There was a basket for each of them, not just for them, but so they could pick it up, 
so they could carry it, so they could witness it, so they could experience it, so they could see it and recognize it as God's provision. That when you take what you have and give it to God, abundant, only he can take it and multiply it and take care of everybody. As a side note, this miracle is recorded in all four Gospels of the Bible. And if you're new to BSF or perhaps new to the Bible, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. So our second principle, only Jesus can truly satisfy our hunger, and Christ's sufficiency overcomes our insufficiency. Some application questions. How would trusting in Christ's sufficiency change the way you live your life today? Walter, that implies we don't trust. Okay, change the question. How would consistent trusting, how would, put whatever word you want in there, how would trusting in Christ's sufficiency change the way you live your life today? How are you relying on yourself instead of on him? There's moments we all do it. You're not alone. I do it. In what areas of your life do you need to lean on and learn to trust in Christ's sufficiency? Perhaps what inadequacies or insufficiencies are holding you back from living out God's plan and purpose for your life? It's not about us, you see. It's about Christ. What he wants for us is for us to bring what we might consider limited resources to him with thanksgiving. And then he'll do the rest. He wants us to be available. He wants us, well, let me rechange the order. Number one, he wants us to be obedient. Then he wants you to be available. Third division, our last division for the night, Jesus walked on water to calm both the disciples and the storm. Verses 22 to 36. So here again, there's a parallel event recording this in John chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And in response to the miracle feeding, the crowd began to reason that Jesus was the prophet God had promised to send them. So, you know, Jesus being Jesus picks up on that, sees that, hears that. Being Jesus knows what's probably going to develop next or certainly what might and disperses the crowd. But before he does that, he takes his disciples and puts them on a boat and deliberately, purposely sends them away, sends them into the sea. The concern there is that the crowd intended to seize him, even if by force to make him their king. I mean, come on. Look at the healings. Look at the food. Look at the, look at the, look at the, look at the. You know, I'm in. I want some of that. Not hard to understand how that crowd could get a little encouraged, a little worked up perhaps. So he gets the disciples into the boat, sends them out. They're going to the other side. He disperses the crowd and, and leaves himself. And in verse 23, we see where he went up to the mountainside to pray. So back up a minute, we're in verse 23 in context, and back in verse 13 is when he just heard about John and tried to get away. And then because of the people's neediness, again, put their needs ahead of his own. So now finally, he's taking the time for himself, going up the mountainside to pray. He's still seeking solace, communion with his father, in our vernacular today, perhaps he was refueling. He was certainly modeling what we should do, what we can do in our time of need. The other thing I notice is he wasn't driven by a schedule, you know. He was driven by his heart. He had a desire to spend time with God. 
he longed to spend that time with his father. And then, of course, Scripture turns again. And meanwhile, back in the boat, I've been to Israel. I've been to the Sea of Galilee. And perhaps you've heard others say this or you've been there yourself. It's as smooth as glass. I mean, we were there a week and a half, almost a week and a half, in that area. You know, right around the Sea of Galilee where he had his ministry. You know, the Magdalene Shores and feeding the thousands and swine running down the hill. I mean, all those stories in Scripture happen there. And when I think of a storm... I can't see that based on my experience, but that's what Scripture tells us. And I've heard others say that, you know, they get these bad storms coming through the mountain pass there. But look at what Scripture tells us today. And I think for us living in Tampa and maybe hurricanes and all and tropical storms, it might be easier for us to picture some of that. But in context, the disciples, they're in the boat, considerable distance from shore. And I don't know how big that is sea is, but I'd say it's pretty big. I mean, you certainly can't look across it, so it's, I meant to Google it tonight, and I forgot to do that, so I'll say maybe seven, eight miles by 20, 30 miles. Big body of water, right? And here we have Jesus who controls the wind and the wave. He allowed them. He intentionally put them in that boat and sent them, not just across the sea, but in that direction. It was all his plan, if you follow that. He wanted them to experience everything he knew they would experience. Again, the teaching moment, the training. He knew what was happening. He's up the mountainside praying. He knows what's going on. He knows where they are. He knows what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're going to face. He allowed them even when the storm came. And here's the key. He allowed them to labor in their own strength. Now, what does that mean in context? Well, they didn't have an outboard motor on that boat, so he allowed them to row harder, faster, for it to stress them, to wear on them, for them to think, respond, react. You know, everything that would happen in that boat. Picture that. I mean, it wasn't just a, a quick minute, right? They were struggling. They were struggling. They rowed their arms off, if you will, before he came to them. He held both the disciples and the storm in the palm of his hands. He is creator God, so he created all of nature, the weather. None of this surprised him. Different translations, some talk about the middle of the night, late into the night. Others say shortly before dawn, but either way, it paints a picture that it's dark, it's bleak, it's black. The storm's crashing, the waves coming up not comfortable situations or conditions. And Jesus, after he was done praying, walked out to meet them. So again, he knew where they were. He knew what was going on. He knew what they needed. And he walks amidst the waves and the storm. Scripture doesn't tell us how that happened, but I was discussing some of this in advance tonight. You know, do you think he parted it? Do you think he walked on the waves? It's good discussion, but none of that matters. What matters is what he did, and he walked out to where they were. Seeing him coming, Scripture tells us the disciples were scared. Even says they thought it was a ghost. They cried out in fear. Well, if it was pitch black and you're in a boat and you've been rowing and fighting and you see something, are you going to be startled? Are you going to be scared? Maybe yes, maybe no, but not hard to maybe wrap our brains around that. But again, this faith-testing, life-threatening storm was no accident. Walter, how do you know all that? Read the story. He was testing them, training them, developing. Jesus, after their crying out in fear, responded to them. It is I. He identified himself. And then he went on to say, don't be afraid. You know, over 300 times in Scripture, God's telling us, do not fear, don't be afraid, right? Teaching us still to depend on Him, to trust Him, to listen to Him, to obey Him, to take confidence in Him that He is sufficient, especially in our insufficiencies. Jesus came to them at the right place, at the right time, 
more than that. He made his presence real, right? When the disciples were there in need, he made his presence real, the place of their deepest need. He didn't get there right when they started panicking or before they started rowing. He got there when it mattered the most. Jesus' presence gives us peace and strength at the time of our greatest need. I've been in that spot. I've been in that spot recently. Have you? I'm sure as a testimony, as part of your story God's given you, many of us could share those stories how God showed up at your greatest point of need, both in terms of salvation and in terms of your journey and your walk with him. Of course, as the story develops, then there's Peter. Verse 28, Peter, if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus says, okay, come. Peter walked towards Jesus. But as soon as he took his eyes off him, Scripture tells us, he started sinking. And again, timing, immediately, his greatest point in need. Jesus caught him and saved him. Peter was fine until he took his focus off Jesus. And there's another point for us, you know, Christ's sufficiency. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. When we get caught up in everything else, pay attention to everything else, we all do it. See my hand in the air? You know, politics, news, whatever. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. Peter and Jesus climbed back in the boat. What happened? Verse 32 tells us everything just calmed down because the winds and the waves obey God. Unspoken word. But the creator get back in the boat. Everything calmed down again. His disciples, Jesus' disciples, had personally experienced and personally participated in these provisions. And these intense personal experiences led them to what I like at the end here, to worship. When you have that level of personal experience and personally participated, it's a natural response is to worship God, who he is, character, attributes, what he's done, what he's done for you, personal God, personal relationship, worshiped him and declare the truth that Jesus was and is for us, Indeed, the Son of God. Jesus was molding his disciples' faith. Jesus is molding your faith. He's molding my faith. Their physical experiences, I like this, physical experiences had revealed incredible spiritual realities. And so as the story ends, they land on the other side and people continue of that region, heard of it, news spread, continued to bring out their sick. I don't know that I saw this before in Scripture, but Scripture records that they begged him to let them touch his cloak. They begged him. They said, if we can just touch your cloak, the edge of your cloak will be healed. And Scripture goes on to tell us in verse 36 where they begged him that everybody that touched the edge of his cloak were healed. You know, many times in Scripture, if I can just touch your cloak, I have the faith and confidence I'll be healed. So our last principle, only Jesus can save the perishing by delivering his people from sin and death. Some application questions. What situation in your life is causing fear or despair? We all go in and out of different situations, circumstances. What storms are you facing, and how can Christ's sufficiency, his presence, his power, meet you right now in your time of greatest need? What storms are you facing, and how can Christ's sufficiency, his presence, and his power meet you right now? in your greatest time of need? And how has your personal experience of Christ's presence and power driven you to worship him and declare him the Son of God 
your personal Savior. Again, who is He? Savior. Personal Savior. Just a reminder, that's it for this lesson tonight, and I thank you for your time and attention. Just a reminder, our next seminar is coming up January 31st, uh, personal quiet time. Just uh, as I like to say, some tools for the toolbox, perhaps helping you develop that discipline, perhaps helping you strengthen that discipline, perhaps giving you a different perspective, God's perspective on how to do that, what to include, many different ways and models, right? Just one that BSF puts forward as a tool to help you and encourage you. Again, that's at 6 o'clock, so I encourage you to take advantage of that. And then tonight, again, thank you for your time. And uh, we'll close in prayer, and you're dismissed. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for leading us, guiding us, speaking to us through your Spirit, through your Word tonight. So many principles, so many applications in this story, Lord. Help us to be receptive of those. Help us to be thankful, grateful. Um, yeah, help me to do those things, Lord. Help me to be, help us to be a witness for you, Lord. Just the people we come across daily in our past. Thank you for these men, for their time, Lord. Ask your continued protection on their health, their schedules, Lord. Bless them, bless their families, and uh, give everybody a great week, Lord. Help us to have a good uh, attendance for our upcoming seminar. And thank you for helping us be not only salt and light, but the men that you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen.